production of Broad and High is funded in part by the Greater Columbus Arts Council, supporting arts, advancing culture, and connecting the community to artists, events, and classes at columbusmakesart.com. From these contributing sponsors and viewers like you, thank you. This time on Broad and High, meet a multimedia artist who combines Japanese and French aesthetics. A visual artist describes how a local restaurant chain made his dream come true. See how the science of humans influences the creations of a Colorado-based woodworker. And hear the indie pop band called Sweet Teeth. This and more, right now on Broad and High. Welcome to Broad and High, I'm your host, Kate Quickle. Tiffany Lawson is a mixed media artist who attributes her success as an artist to community arts programs and many trips to galleries and museums across Ohio. Her talent is a testament to both nature and nurture with Grandpa Smokey Brown and other local artists like Amina Robinson and Queen Brooks in her life. We met up with Tiffany in her home studio and talked about her process and the common themes in her work. I really make work based off of what I'm experiencing and the books that I read. So that's a that's a big a big part of my process. Growing up, I always was a, a drawer, if you will. Um, my favorite place to draw was in the end table drawers and behind the couch. Um, my mother wasn't a fan of that at all, um, and, and I'd sign them. They were all masterpieces in my mind. So it's always been sort of my thing. His mom ran a church program across the street, Ohio Avenue Methodist Church, and we had an art squad called the Bebe Squad. Um, and also the workshops brought in local artists like uh, Amina Robinson, Queen Brooks, Grandpa Smokey Brown, and my uncle Duart. So art has always been a part of my life. Wabi Sabi has very much given me freedom because uh, it, it it is very hard to sit in front of a stark white canvas and figure out where to make your first mark. So with Wabi Sabi, it gave me a sense of no matter where I make the mark, as imperfect as it could be, it is beautiful. And it, it just freed my practice. And so when I make mistakes, they're happy mistakes like Bob Ross. It is a uh, aesthetic of impermanence. Um, and there's beauty in that as it continues, as those imperfections continue to build even or age through time. There's beauty in those. A seat at the table actually started off as just a, um, a daily sketch, practice sketch, um, and it, it developed into a series. In exploring black life or even the healing component of it, it's important for us to have a seat at the table to begin to have these conversations so that new work can be done. Um, and, and, and in a lot of ways, there haven't been those seats or a table. Um, so in regards to my several seats, I'll bring my own seat, several of them, as a matter of fact. No two people's seat is alike. Everybody brings something different to the table, so it was important to make each seat separate from each other. In my opinion, uh, black art of the past, because we're kind of moving into a newer generation, and that's what I mean in terms of um, capta capturing joy and healing as opposed to just the, um, I guess it is, dis there are some, I guess, despair with black art. Um, specifically regarding uh, slavery and the Great Migration and discrimination and all those things are still very much important um, but I do believe those stories have been told and those aren't necessarily the stories that I can tell. I would like to highlight the things that are more prevalent today uh, for black people which like, again are similar um, but most importantly the healing process like where we have come from to where we are now because there is greater work to do. So um, the healing aspect of black life, it exists, but it, it is, I think, in a lot of ways uh, just not explored. 
there, there is a component of black resilience, I think, that needs to be captured in a different way. Bricolage is a French word that means basically using things that are at hand. This is a taquito box. My process doing that, I believe that I am um, exploring black resilience in a way that we've always had to um, make use of what we have, use what you got. Um, and that is very much a big component of black life. Mostly in general, the, the, the tie that binds is their, the brown paper bags. Uh, so a lot of times I'll start with just uh, opening up the brown paper bag and I tend to consider what was in the bag or because brown paper is very much recycled, I tend to think about the, the, the process of that recycle. Who had the bag before me, what was in the bag, um, and so that's a big, that's a big part of I think what, what shows up on the brown bag. It gives me different aspects to kind of be creative with in regards to the imperfections of the bag. So it, it brings a little bit more character, I think, to, to the piece. From the beginning, I just think of a story that I'm trying to tell. The project that I'm working on now is, uh, her name is Mother Drum. And I'm exploring the James Weldon Johnson, God's Trombones. There's seven sermons that he believes that, you know, black people have kind of thrived on. I generally start from something that I'm, I'm reading or, again, a story that I'm trying to tell. And I use my curated medias. I kind of sift through some magazines and tear out some images or, you know, cut out a lot of texture is what I find myself using. Around the Way USA very much is a exploration of community. So on one side, it's almost a tale of two cities. So on one side, you have a beautiful, thriving, vibrant community. On the other side, it's kind of dilapidated, uh, kind of depleted on the other side. So I was exploring community in regard to if there is a difference between a community and a neighborhood. Because in a lot of cases, especially here in Columbus, as neighborhoods are being gentrified, you lose that. It almost seems like they preserve communities or neighborhoods that they deem, I guess, um, worth it, it seems like. So the, the communities that get washed out it, it will never remember them because they're completely gone. So roller skates are a big uh, part of my process, to be quite honest, when I'm stuck or can't figure out how things that I've made are related or how to build a work. Because I very much, the, the 3D elements I have to build, I have to actually figure out how to engineer them so they don't fall apart. So a lot of that I do on my skates. So I have a strobe light, um, I close the curtains, and I turn my music up as loud as I can and you know, I kind of just twirl around here. It, it does help. It actually just takes me out of my mind in regards to my creativity for just a moment, long enough to figure out how the pieces fit together. To see more of her amazing creations, check her out online or on Instagram at 100 Mart Studio. Brian Moss is a cartoonist and painter who was also inspired by Amina Robinson. He is proud to be born and raised on the South Side and draws his motivation from many sources. He talked with us about his creative process and much more. How many comic books do you own? <laughs> okay, let's put it like this. Um, how many comic books do I own? I own 20 bookshelves of graphic novels. <laughs> I think I might open a library one day. So I was born in 1981 on the south end of Columbus, so born and raised. Now that I reflect back on it, I grew up really poor. When you say it, it sounds pretty triggering, but actually I learned a lot. That's how I like figured out how to do art through like a grassroots process. Like I signed up for art classes at Schiller Park. That's when I discovered and understood that I was gonna be an artist. 
after that, it was more just like drawing, drawing, drawing. So just nonstop, just obsessed with it. So when I was like 10 or 11, that's when I discovered comic books. And then that's when it shifted. So then I was just drawing comics all the time. The current project I just finished up and that I'm still working on a little bit here and there is a comic book called Eightfold Path. It's a 225 page comic. The turnaround time for the book was six months. So it was a team of us, about six to eight people just working around the clock on this book. I'm the beginning and the end of it, which means that I approve what goes through and what doesn't. So it's almost as like a director. The idea of converting a script into a comic book is actually a very difficult process. You start with penciling, um, we go through this process called thumbnailing, which is where you just literally sketch out the idea. And then after that, you go into like your official pencil, which is like where you're like, okay, this works. Now let's do the paneling and actually draw it in pencil and make that work. After that, we ink it. The inking part's kind of like the fun. It's kind of like the jazz of it. And then after that, we scan it in, digitally color it. Now make this into this Hitchcockian, like masterpiece comic. They're like, all right, uh, we build it while we fly. So another project that I worked on that was super awesome, super epic, a dream come true. White Castle and Coca-Cola called me and was like, oh, would you like to do the art for the 100th anniversary? Would you be interested in designing a cup? And I was like, yeah. And then I was like, we should do like three cups. <laughs> it's, like, it's like a collector thing. Now, I don't know about you guys, but I always wanted to design something like this. And even from when I was a kid, because what I really have a lot of passion about is actually like making products cool. And so we developed the narrative from, from the beginning and the original uh, Billy Ingram, the founder. It shows like the diner, the first location, um, what the first gift card looks like. So yeah, this is all my narrative, all my storytelling I came up with. And then obviously me there at the end as any great renaissance painter would do, which is include themselves into <laughs> the masterpiece. <laughs> so yeah, so if you get a chance, look for those cups online, you know? <laughs>For me, lifting up other people within the community through my work, I would say it's a very critical part of what I do. The mural I recently completed was one of the one and only Hanif. It's actually on a law firm on Miller in Maine. Um, Hanif is a writer. <laughs> Hanif is a famous writer. Hanif and I went to middle school together. There's a bit of an age difference, but there's this indirect relationship that we've always had. With Hanif, the cool thing about it is that he stayed. That builds up Columbus. That was my personal goal too. I could move, but I choose not to because the idea of building up Columbus. We end up calling the mural the People's Mural because of how the community got behind it. The process for the People's Mural was to show Hanif as a mosaic. Well, the reason I wanted to really inject a lot of color in it has more to do with the quote. There is something about setting eyes on the people who hold you up instead of simply imagining them. The idea of this is where the characters in the background, and these are people that are in the community too. I put them all in black and white. And I put Hanif in color because we realize as artists that we're like isolated in the sense we think we're isolated and it's actually not the case. We actually have people who support us and that care. 
but just going through that process you get kind of lost and it's pretty exhausting so it has a lot of personal meaning when I designed this. So in the summer of 2020, I moved into Mina Robinson's home uh, through the Columbus Museum of Art. Now what I served as was as the manager, but there's kind of like a duality to it, which was that Amina Robinson was my mentor. I met Amina Robinson when I started at the Columbus Museum of Art in May of 2001. So it had a, like a higher purpose for me. It's a curated museum space, so you're essentially inside Amina Robinson. The spirit's definitely there, the energy's there. It was probably the least art productive I was, but the most healing process I've had. I was able to slow down and like actually like <sighs> relax, you know, because of the residency, not having to worry about, you know, the finances and stuff like that. It's the only space where I can like really like fly where I can like just like do whatever I want in it you know it's like a healing space I would say the one thing Amina said to me that still resonates with me today is keep drawing don't stop drawing and at the time I'm like don't tell me that I draw all the time like that's absurd I'll never stop drawing but then what happens is that Life happens. <laughs> Life occurs and then you get older and drawing becomes harder. So that message, just like keep drawing, has more importance to me now than when she told me that when I was 22 years old, you know? I mean, but that's just like a master teacher, right? <laughs> so yeah, so that's pretty cool. To see more of his work, find him on Instagram at Strange Things Moss. The creations of woodworker Greg Vihill have been described as anthropology meets art. He works with mostly found objects and spends countless hours making them into works of art. Let's take a look at his one-of-a-kind creations. I like working in wood because I like to recycle the wood that's around the valley here, whether it be abstract or realism art. I look at my past experience in anthropology and the culture of man, uh, whether it be culture or physical anthropology, and then I try to incorporate that into the wood, whether it be Native American images or images that project uh, certain lifestyles of man. That's what I create my work on. I study the wood first and then I create a sculpture that will enhance and, and it creates my pieces. I, I love it. A lot of times when I do start with a piece of wood, such as a, a block, a, a log or ash or whatever the type of wood it may be, and I start to work the wood into the sculpture and then I figure out later on there is an imperfection in the wood whether it be a knot or a split in the middle of the wood I just make that part of the sculpture and work with it sometimes imperfections in a piece of wood enhances my sculpture I don't use any liquid stains I like using the more natural stains and I like a more natural finish to enhance the wood grain and also the wood and then when I do finish it work, as far as waxing it, it's all hand waxed and hand polished. I've always been interested in the arts, but later on, I developed that interest into more of the museum field. And now that I'm retired, I can go back into the art field and share it with my fellow artists and with the community here in the Valley. Brothers Sam and Stuart are the indie pop band called Sweet Teeth. One is a classically trained cellist, the other rocks out on guitar and drum machine. They recently visited us in the studio for a Broad and High Presents recording. We quickly discovered how they make this seemingly off-kilter pairing find balance. <laughs> Yeah. 
To hear more from these two, find them on Facebook at Sweet Teeth Columbus or on Instagram at Sweet Teeth Band. Well, that's our show. Remember, you can find all of our stories online at WOSU.org as well as on our YouTube channel. For all of us here at WOSU, I'm Kate Quickle. Thanks for watching.
production of Broad and High is funded in part by the Greater Columbus Arts Council, supporting arts, advancing culture, and connecting the community to artists, events, and classes at columbusmakesart.com.